This week on the show, Mac Haddow is back with us to discuss Nevada Board of Pharmacy, intent to schedule, and the AKA's new truth and labeling program. So Mac, thanks so much for coming back on. I'm glad to be with you. I got a lot of questions, both when Nevada happened and then also the truth mm-hmm. and labeling program. So I tried to condense them as, as much as I could. And yeah, just really glad to have you on here because there's been lots of rumors flying around. So I just wanted to clear, clear the air. I just have a list. So we'll go to uh, Nevada Board of Pharmacy first. I did write a letter to, to Pete that I was hoping to get on. I don't think I submitted it in time for the, uh, the town hall. Basically, that said, since the announcement from Nevada Board of Pharmacy intent to schedule Kratom, I had numerous consumers contact me to ask me how this could happen with the Nevada KCPA in place, and I wasn't sure what to tell them. That's the essential question. Uh, There are a couple of things that, based on conversations I've had with the legal counsel at the uh, Board of Pharmacy and with the staff director, there was a concern that the Board of Pharmacy had taken a some sort of a uh, signal from the passage of the KCPA because at the last minute there was an amendment that was filed that related to who was going to enforce it. And uh, there were some people who believed that because that amendment was made in deleting the enforcement agency that that was a signal for the Board of Pharmacy to actually not only become the regulatory body but as a course of that Uh, make a decision about scheduling of Kratom, which would essentially ban it. Uh, First, the original bill uh, included the language for the Board of Pharmacy being the regulatory agency, and it was the legislature that stripped that out. And so Uh anyone who believed that there was an intent that the Board of Pharmacy would have any role whatever in the uh, Kratom Consumer Protection Act's regulatory framework in Nevada was simply wrong. Uh, and the staff has disavowed that. They, they believe that, that the uh, KCPA is one regulatory approach. They do not believe that it in any way impacts the authority of the Board of Pharmacy. And based on input that the Board of Pharmacy received from a quarterly meeting that they hold, which includes stakeholders like the uh, coroners and medical examiners, law enforcement, and then they have some citizens drug uh, ad- advocacy groups and they got a couple of different data inputs that led to their work session and the discussion that took place there and then ultimately led to the decision by the board of pharmacy to proceed with a scheduling process uh, the first input was a claim made by the uh, medical examiners and coroners that there were multiple deaths that were associated with kratom Uh, And in fact, it was characterized uh, incorrectly, by the way, that these were deaths that were Kratom only. Um, There there was no data provided that supported that claim. Uh, I have asked for and they have promised that they will send me all of the input. Uh, But upon that inquiry, they acknowledged that in fact, there was no data uh, nor a representation in the end from the coroners that, uh, that these are Kratom only deaths, but would be the same kind of deaths that the FDA has reported and that the CDC has reported on where there was Kratom detected in the bloodstream of an individual who had died, but there was no specific assessment made about whether Kratom had hit some uh, toxicity level that would have led to the death. And we know that that's unlikely, uh, if not untrue. And, and the other question is whether it was a result of a adulterated Kratom product that had in it a, uh, a, an adulterant that was toxic, like we saw in Sweden with O-desmethyltramadol, or like we have seen since, where uh, some unscrupulous vendors simply spike it with morphine or heroin or fentanyl, and that leads to a death. Or secondly, and, and this is the hard part, is it because of polydrug use, where a person is currently experiencing an addiction level um, consumption of an opioid, and they are using Kratom appropriately to try to wean off of uh, that opioid addiction. And if that's the case, it would not be at the least bit surprising that at the time of their death, which, be, which would have been caused by the opioids with, with the, the respiratory suppression, uh, that they might also have Kratom in their system because they were attempting to wean off of or reduce the opioid consumption. So all of that in place, that was the, the, the argument that was made. And then the law enforcement people Uh, I'm told, expressed a general concern based on reports that they had been receiving from the FDA about the dangers of Kratom, but had no specific data. 
And then the third group, and this is one that was, again, fascinating, the, uh, the citizens' advocacy groups, anti-drug advocacy groups, claimed that they had sent uh, consumers into various shops selling Kratom in the state of Nevada, and they consistently got a report back that when they inquired as to the effects of Kratom, that the clerks at the retail outlets would say things like, oh, it gets you high, it's great, it's a, it's a wonderful thing, or it would have a specific therapeutic benefit from the purchase of that Kratom product. I mean, whether that is verified or not remains to be seen. If it happens, uh, and, and in fact, they can verify that these kinds of things happen, uh, that speaks to an enforcement issue about the appropriate uh, practices by a Kratom vendor it has nothing to do with Kratom itself, and it certainly should not be the basis for scheduling. Uh, so that, that's sort of where we have left it. The good news for us is that none of the members of the Board of Pharmacy expressed any um, interest in having this whole issue be expedited and therefore treated on a fast track. Uh, so that means that they will go through the normal scheduling process, which uh, takes about two years. And during that two year period, we're gonna have the opportunity to participate in the public hearing and uh, along the way, give lots of input in terms of challenging some of the representations that have been made. It was unfortunate that because it was a work session, uh, there was not a lot, a lot of public notice, and I didn't learn about the actual work session until the late the night before uh, they were holding this meeting in Las Vegas and being unable to get on a flight to get out there in time. Uh, I requested the availability to join the meeting uh, remotely, which they had not set up because it was a work session and therefore not in their traditional uh, public settings where they would broadcast and allow for remote participation. Uh, but they did take note during the meeting and told the members of the board, the staff did, that we had made the inquiry and requested the opportunity. And it was on the record that uh, they acknowledged that we would, the American Kratom Association would be participating in future public hearings on that issue. So overall, I think we're in good shape. We intend to, uh, uh, in the next session of the Nevada legislature, which will obviously be within that two year period, uh, we're gonna clarify this issue for the Board of Pharmacy so that there is uh, certainly no doubt. Now, that will be an interesting battle given the input from the medical examiners and coroners and the citizen uh, drug advocacy groups. So we'll see how that plays out. Yeah, and there's a couple of big companies out in uh, Nevada, I believe, that I don't think they're going to take too kindly to be all of a sudden the, it being scheduled. So I think uh, the Nevada Board of Pharmacy is going to have a fight on their hands, and hopefully we'll, we'll come out on top. You know, you were talking about spiked or... Um, basically somebody dying from poly drug use, you know, it's also research chemicals that are, wouldn't show up on drug tests. And then the New England Journal of Medicine, how, how they came out with the very specific um, postmortem blood test that, that said that it finds drugs that it, any normal uh, test wouldn't find. Yeah, that was reported in, uh, in the, rep the, the commentary that was provided by the Colorado researchers who had initially found that there were four deaths of a total of 15 that were Kratom only. And that was based on the data that was accumulated by the medical examiners in Colorado. Uh, and that New England Journal of Medicine article then clarified that when they applied the more uh, sophisticated and updated analytical tools and equipment that wouldn't necessarily be available because of resource restraints at a local medical examiner's office, they found that, that those deaths, with the exception of one where there was not sufficient blood to make any determination one way or another, that they were actually polydrug use. So you hear these reports, and, and they're, they're, they're not accurate based on the science of it. And then you have the other, and I think this is an important issue, that people uh, try to associate a, a kratom detection in a tox screen of a decedent as being a cause of a kratom death. And that's largely the result of very poor framing of reports from the FDA and the Centers for Disease Control, because the headline that came out of the CDC report was that they had 91 people that had died of Kratom. Well, the fact of the matter was those were 91 that had Kratom detected. And of those, there was only one at the end of the day that had, that were, for which they had no data, none, none that could be attributed to Kratom alone. Now, I'm not saying that you can't overdose on Kratom. I think that anything is possible. Uh, you've seen some very interesting 
reports about various substances that people use, including water. If you, there, there's been a case of overdosing on water where someone upset the electrolytes in their, in their body to the point that they died uh, you know, from water intoxication. So I'm not suggesting that it's not possible. I'm saying that as the common practice, which is the way we predicate all public policy with respect to foods and substances, in the normal course of the use of these products, they're not dangerous. And Kratom doesn't show any kind of data that would support a conclusion by any regulator that in fact it deserves to be scheduled or regulated in, in such an onerous fashion based on, on data, uh, on the safety data. So I think uh, we're gonna continue to take that fight to anyone who wants to try to make buy uh, that are showing up around the country. It's just simply not true unless it's an adulterated Kratom product as we saw in Sweden or polydrug use. And, and then another thing, and you correctly pointed out there may be some undetectable uh, research chemicals that are not going to show up on a talk screen because they're new or because they just don't have the test panel for them that could cause a death. And then there's the possibility of an underlying medical condition. I mean, you look at the FDA's own reports of the 44 alleged deaths that they reported. And when we FOIA'd those records and got a hold of the autopsies, you see the one kid that died while he was swimming of a heart failure and he happened to have Kratom in his system. So what? Uh, he died of heart failure from an underlying medical condition that he had while he was swimming. Uh, and yet they want to call that a Kratom death. So you could see how, how the, the, uh, this overreaching kind of fervor by the FDA and those who support them to claim that there are deaths that are associated with Kratom when they have nothing to do with them. And we're going to continue to fight that battle. Well, there was, a, there was a case recently in Pennsylvania where the, the mom got charged with uh, her son's 15-year-old son's death with a heroin overdose, and he also had Kratom in his system, and the pathologist wrote that uh, either the Kratom or the heroin would have killed him on his own. So I did call the pathologist. I didn't get a call back, but I wanted to find out because maybe that pathologist knows what the toxic level of Kratom is because nobody else seems to know it. Well, th there is no data. I mean, they, they can... Uh, you can make a, a judgment that this is the highest level of uh, reported Kratom in a talk screen. And from that, you would only be able to conclude it's the highest level that's been reported. Uh, you can't say that because it's the highest level, that therefore it caused an overdose. Uh, and the reason is, you look at the pharmacologic uh, activity of Kratom, and we know that it's a partial agonist. It doesn't hit the respiratory system. And so for someone to say that an equal amount in a talk screen of heroin and an equal amount of kratom, that they have the same effects. They do not. Now, there may be a, a combined effect, and that's something that's worth study, but it's certainly not a basis for anyone making a conclusion. And, and it's interesting because there was a, a medical examiner in Idaho uh, that had reported on a death where the, the individual had taken a lot of substances, including kratom, had gone out, passed out, and died of hypothermia, right? Uh, he reported the death as because of what was on the talk screen and the prevalence of the heroin, which I think was heroin, which was a known sedative that would have uh, created not just a, a state of passing out, but have kept him out for a long time. He reported it that way. He said the FDA called him and said, we want you to change the autopsy report to call this a kratom death. And he said, why would I do that? And they said, well, because the talk screen shows there was kratom in the system. He said, but that's not what caused his death. It's because of the, the other drug that was far more powerful. And the FDA said, well, it would help us if you would call it Kratom. Help whom? Help the truth? Help find the, the reality? No, it's, the FDA has a narrative and a regulatory agenda which is targeting Kratom. And thank God this medical examiner said, I'm not doing it. And then reported it to the state um, uh, the medical examiner's board. This is the kind of thing the FDA is doing. It is, it is unethical. It is wrong for them to be engaged in that. And you have to ask yourself when you read any report these days that there is a Kratom death, who was behind that report? Was it the FDA manipulating the data or was it an actual misinformed uh, medical examiner? That's an unknown question at this point. But again, another battle we have to continue to fight. Right, yeah, definitely a good point. So back to the KCPA, it, it seemed like the main issue in Nevada there was that last minute switch for the regulatory uh, agency. Yes. And so the, the Board of Pharmacy was never supposed to ha have control over that. Is that correct? That's correct. It would be the <laughs> local Department of Health because they, they, they look over food or how, how would that, who was designated? 
So, so each state is a little different and it depends on the way that they have established their statutory authority for various responsibilities by regulatory agencies. Uh, typically, the uh, authorization for Kratom's regulation would come on the Department of Agriculture. That's who we advocate for because Kratom is a food and a dietary ingredient. Uh, it is possible for it to become a dietary supplement, uh, which would have Im imposed restrictions on the kinds of claims that can be made. They would be called structure function claims, but that's only if it gets a new dietary ingredient approval from the F or a registration with the FDA. The FDA has not objected to, and the FDA currently is objecting all of those NDIs based on the, the bid by the commissioner's office that they want to pursue their claim that Kratom is schedulable and therefore they're not going to do anything. So right now, the Department of Agriculture is the perfect place for it to be regulated. In the state of Nevada, uh, they looked at doing it through the uh, business and, and uh, registration department because there was a component of the bill that would have required for a registration of the product. Uh, you know, we're, we're agnostic on that. We prefer the agriculture. Uh, probably the worst, the absolute worst place for any state to place a regulatory authority is the Board of Pharmacy with respect to Kratom because boards of pharmacy typically do scheduling decisions and they, most states mirror the same requirements for scheduling as the federal government has under the Controlled Substances Act. And in the state of Arizona, there was initially an effort by the Board of Pharmacy to regulate Kratom. And after they listened to us, we testified on two separate hearings, they agreed that they didn't have the authority to do, I mean, because it wasn't a Schedule One substance under the Federal Controlled Substances Act, they didn't have the authority to do it. Now, some states have broader regulatory authority granted by their legislatures to go beyond what the Federal uh, uh, Controlled Substances Act criteria are. And so they can have non-federally scheduled substances be scheduled in a particular state. Those are rare but they exist. And so there's the possibility that could happen. But we don't like the boards of pharmacy because it's the wrong place for Kratom. Kratom is not a drug. That's what boards of pharmacies regulate. It is a food and it properly is classified in that regard. So with everything happening in Nevada, and I, I thank you for sending over those, uh, the federal and the, the updated state KCPA so I could take a look at that. And that other bill too, it's, it's all kind of, we can, we can talk about that too. It all kind of wraps in together. But what's happening in Nevada, I, I noticed with the federal KCPA that it does say directly in there that it's going to remove the import alert as well as remove the controlled substance recommendation from DEA or NIH. Now, I looked at the existing Nevada KCPA. I couldn't find anything in there that said it will not be scheduled or not be prescription um, is there any plans to update the state KCPA to kind of more reflect the federal or how's that going to work? Well, yes, we, we're going to have to strengthen the Nevada or get an agreement from the Board of Pharmacy that they're going to drop this. Uh, but we, we will look to strengthen the bill to make sure there's clarity around the issue as to whether the legislature intended that Kratom would become a scheduled substance. But the notwithstanding that, completely separate authority by the Board of Pharmacy. They can take any substance and they can initiate and prosecute a, a case for scheduling. So the KCPA currently uh, doesn't uh, envision that restriction on them. I don't know that we could get that kind of blanket restriction placed. But we might. Uh, we're going to examine this carefully to see exactly what motivated it. We're hopeful that the Board of Pharmacy will understand that the predicate for their scheduling action fails to meet the criteria that is established for such scheduling decisions, uh, despite the broad discretion that most of these statutes allow, and that's the, the wild card that we need to guard against, but the facts don't support the claims that were made, and these were very general claims made by well-intentioned groups, perhaps, and they're just overreaching and following what the FDA does. This is a repeat of the FDA narrative. You see it insidiously uh, find its way into virtually all of these uh, reports that are made by medical examiners. Uh, you see it by the citizen drug advocacy groups, and you see it by law enforcement. Nobody can point to precise data. They just like to follow the FDA line, and that's where we have to take our battle, I think. Right, yeah. I mean, we saw it in uh, Mississippi. You know, they make all types of claims with deaths and people pawning all the stuff in their house to get Kratom, but don't show any proof of it. 
So you, you said you're gonna, you guys are gonna examine the KCPA and see if you can add some more verbiage or, or something to strengthen it up a little bit more going forward? Well, in the particular case of Nevada, it, we're gonna have a prescriptive provision, hopefully added, amended to that bill. It simply says that the, the Board of Pharmacy has no authority in this area over Kratom because it is a food. And that's what we hope to be able to do. Uh, you know, we bring into that discussion the medical examiners not a part of the discussion in the first go around with the bill. So it, it, with legislative things, it's like, it's like any sports event. The reason you play the game is to find a winner. And with respect to a legislative battle, it's the same thing. Uh, you have to go through the procedure. Uh, lots of players can come in from the sidelines and uh, we'll have to see how that plays out. But we're gonna give it our best effort to, uh, to restrict the ability of the Board of Pharmacy in Nevada to go after Kratom uh, based on it being an unapproved drug, uh, which the FDA narrative includes, because the point of the KCPA was to protect consumers and to allow for consumer access to safe and unadulterated and non-contaminated Kratom products. And for the Board of Pharmacy to come in behind that and, and slap the legislature in the face and say, well, we don't care what you did. We're going to go ahead and schedule it. I think that's the conflict, and we'll, we'll, have a, we'll, we'll certainly have a good go at, uh, at trying to resolve that issue. Any word on when, oh yeah, you said it's going to be like two years stretched out, right? So there's no word about when that first meeting is or anything like that? No word yet. Now, it is possible that this thing could catch fire uh, with some member of the Board of Pharmacy and they could accelerate it. But the next meeting of the Board of Pharmacy is in November or in September and it will definitely, I'm told by the staff, not be on that uh, meeting. And then they think probably the first of the year or some point thereafter, they might wait until after the legislative session, which would be smart on their part, uh, to have their first public hearing on this issue. And then they would prosecute their claim or, or effort after that. So uh, we're, we're gonna be intensely involved in this uh, throughout that process and making sure that they get good data, that they understand the arguments against it and the predicate upon which the, the Kratom Consumer Protection Act was passed initially. And we think we'll win the day on that. I do have it's kind of a bunch of questions about the truth and labeling program. And then some of them kind of circle back around to the KCPA so we can get into that. But this, the new truth, truth and labeling program, um, we've had so many people basically talking shit on the internet about you guys are in bed with the, with the FDA to the snitch snitch program. Um, do you want to say what the truth and labeling program is? Sure. The FDA hardly is a partner. In order to have a conspiracy, you have to have two people participating at least. Uh, we have tried unsuccessfully to get the FDA to sit down with the AKA in a meeting where we can discuss these issues and they have refused for more than three years. Uh, so for anyone to suggest that the AKA is in a conspiracy with the FDA to do anything is simply not, not telling the truth. It's, it doesn't make any sense. But I understand the concern because here, if you look at it from just the top level, you say, okay, here's this citizens advocacy group that now is putting into place a program that asks the citizens to report to them uh, the bad actors who are advertising Kratom products uh, with impermissible health claims. So that makes you, that makes you the snitch, right? You're, you're the narc. I was called the narc by, <laughs> by one of these folks. Um, so, so here's the reality. In the dietary supplement industry today, there is there is not sufficient resources by the FDA to hire the number of investigators that would be necessary to go out and inspect all food establishments or dietary supplement establishments in the country. There are thousands of them uh, with with tens of thousands of products. Okay, it's a it's today a fifty three billion dollar industry, uh, but but the the only way that the Congress and the FDA have accepted the ability of the dietary supplement industry to grow to that level in the regulation model. So the agreement is, that, and it's in the law, that if anyone observes an adverse event that's associated with the consumption of a dietary supplement product, it gets reported. That could be a citizen. It could be a, uh, a health professional. And this is the, the interesting part. The industry can report it. And there are agreements, specific agreements, with the Natural Products Alliance, which is one of the... Uh, or Natural Products Association, and a number of the other dietary supplement trade organizations who will report their, the, uh, any violation 
of a company that's making an impermissible health claim. So if the FDA were doing their job on Kratom, which they're not, and if they were properly regulating it under the appropriate regulatory scheme for foods, which they are not, we would have this very same pattern that I've just described in place. And for someone to suggest that, oh, I don't want, I don't want the FDA uh, partnering with, a, or I'm sorry, the AK to partner with the FDA in doing this. We're not partnering with anyone. The procedure is simple. We ask for to make a report about the, the, an observation with the data that they've collected, whether it's a website or brochure or blog post or whatever it is, where an impermissible health claim is made that is, that is associated with a vendor who is marketing a product where, for which that claim is made. We will then take the evidence that's provided, look at the report and establish whether it's credible. And then we will look at, with that evidence, we'll reach out to the vendor. Now, that's an important step. And we'll ask the vendor. Now, if the vendor doesn't have a, uh, an address or a way to contact them uh, that we can trace, that's a violation in and of itself of the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, because if you're entering into commerce, any product for which you are making any claim, whether it's a food claim or a, a nutritional claim or it's a, a therapeutic claim, you have to have an easily accessible label that shows exactly who's manufactured that product. But if, assuming we could reach them, we'll, we'll engage a discussion and from that, we'll determine whether or not it was an inadvertent mistake because they didn't know or they didn't understand the parameters under which the, uh, the labeling could be done. For example, there are some companies who don't understand that you are not permitted under commercial speech, and this is the threshold that's important, that you, if you're uh, selling a Kratom product, you can't post a, a uh, scientific article that supports the quality of the product or any therapeutic benefit of it on your website or any blog post or on any Facebook post that you have control over because that becomes an, an, a, uh, an, an impermissible health claim, a therapeutic claim. You can't do it. Some companies don't know that. So we would certainly talk to them and say, here's what, here's what the rules are and are you willing to voluntarily comply? And if they are, the, the case closed. We're done because all we're trying to do is protect the marketplace from consumers being misled in the purchase of a Kratom product uh, about what its therapeutic benefits might be. Uh, so on commercial speech, that's the rule. If we cannot find cooperation or can't identify that vendor and we have the proof, all we're gonna do is turn it over to the FDA. We'll submit it under the existing reporting mechanisms that are provided and we'll ask them to investigate it. That's the end of the story with us. We're trying to make sure that what the FDA cannot do, which they're already doing, is to paint the Kratom industry that the, that the commercial speech is so far out of control that it cannot be appropriately regulated and therefore everyone is at risk. And when people ask me for the proof of that, and I'll tell you the thing that triggered the truth and labeling uh, program that we developed is what happened in Ohio. You have the, the Ohio Department of Agriculture Food Safety Division that went into a Kratom vendor and said, you cannot sell Kratom capsules, pills, or beverages because it violates the state law and the federal law because they are unapproved drugs. The vendor said, what are you talking about? They said, well, here's two documents and they provided two. So it's on the record. There's no, there's no uh, any ambiguity about what the FDA and the Department of Agriculture in Ohio was trying to do. The first document was the FDA statement that Kratom is an opioid, an unapproved drug, and is responsible for the deaths of dozens of people. Uh, and it has opioid-like effects and, you know, the, the standard uh, narrative of the FDA. Mm -hmm. The second document was a news report about how in 2019 that they had, uh, they, they had sent warning letters to two specific Kratom vendors for making impermissible health claims. And they were right, by the way. They were, these claims were about opioid cessation and arthritis pain relief and other therapeutic claims. So th that was the, the sole basis for the Department of Agriculture to, uh, to interdict these particular Kratom supplies. And they limited it to pills, capsules, and beverages because they said, the FDA has told us that any Kratom product that is in a human consumption form, and the Department of Agriculture said, well, if it's in a pill or a capsule or a beverage, we know it's for human consumption, don't know so much about the powders because you could bathe yourself in the power, you could make a paste of it and rub it on your skin, whatever they thought, but they were at least willing to take this action. So when we contested this, we hired a law firm that gave them, one of the most respected law firms in Washington, D.C., gave them an opinion letter that indicated that in fact, Kratom is appropriate.
strictly regulated as a food, not as an unapproved drug, that the FDA was wrong on the science and wrong on the policy with respect to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act classification of Kratom. And then we hired a local law firm, which did a specific analysis of the Ohio law and pointed out that they were wrong there too, that they had no authority uh, under the state statute to extend beyond what the federal uh, the, the law said. And so they're sort of in a box, you would think. And their answer back was, well, what we're told is this advertising is so pervasive, so pervasive, that's the commercial speech element of this, that it represents an, the, what the Kratom uh, consumer is exposed to. And the only reasonable way to protect the consumer is to apply the ban, which they will justify in the courts as saying that there's no other way to control this problem. Now, this goes back to the, the seminal case that was tried by the courts as Boyles versus uh, Young's case where the Supreme Court showed the distinction between commercial speech and non-commercial speech. And in that ruling, they said that the FDA can appropriately uh, stop any uh, commercial speech in a Kratom vendor, in this case, from making any therapeutic health claim in any form, in any way, and they, they had full regulatory authority to do it. But they said non-commercial speech, which constitutes the individual citizens who want to say that they, a product that they're using has some sort of a benefit, including therapeutic benefits, they are free to do so. So that accounts for why, on one hand, the AKA can say everything that we want to say and do say and, and repeat what uh, Kratom consumers are finding in terms of therapeutic benefits, but a Kratom vendor cannot. And a Kratom vendor can't even point to the AK website where we make those claims because that would be viewed as impermissible therapeutic benefits for economic gain. And that's the key here to do it. So what are we left with? If we allow the FDA to paint all Kratom sales as commercial speech and therefore be able to shut us down, we are on, we are on a crash course to total bans of Kratom. So those people that say, oh, well, wait a minute, the AK is a narc, the AK is just trying to rat us out, the AK is trying to squeeze out the small vendors. I've heard this too. So we believe, and we're a consumer organization, we don't care what the large vendors do or the small vendors do, except that we hope that they will construct a competitively priced marketplace for quality Kratom products. That's, that's what we think works. That's the capitalist system. The people that are complaining, some, those that understand it, and I think there are a couple who really do understand it, what they're objecting to is that we're now saying that a, a small Kratom vendor who is unwilling to invest in the equipment that's necessary to properly formulate a Kratom product into a finished good that doesn't allow for safely doing so. So in other words, they don't have any controls on adulteration or contaminants. They don't have any uh, SOPs in place for their employees to tell them the exact procedures, and this is costly, by the way, you have to invest in it. You have to keep documentation. You have to have a master manufacturing record. You have to have these documents in place. These Kratom vendors that don't want to uh, subs subscribe to the very regulatory form that if the FDA were doing their job, they would already be under, these are the rogues in this business. And I was told by one particular vendor who called me every name in the book, said that I had violated every constitutional right that he had, that he wasn't ever gonna be an AKA friend again. Well, guess what? If he, the only way that, the only thing we care about is that he produces a safe product. And that's defined by meeting the standards for food production of a finished product. He's unwilling to do it. And I think there are others who have for a long time skated under the radar, being able to produce cheap products that compete against legitimate small and large Kratom manufacturers. And they're gutting the marketplace because they don't invest in the safety protocols that are necessary. So I say to them, hey, you're gone. It's just, if you're not willing to do what we've asked you to do, uh, and, and not us, but the, the federal government to comply with the production of a safe product, then we hope that you're eliminated from the marketplace because that's not protecting consumers. The only other thing that can kill the con consumer marketplace for Kratom other than these bad claims is if you produce an unsafe product that kills people. And I was on a call last night with, uh, with the people over in Indonesia, uh, with the, the FDA there, and they're struggling to come up with the right regulatory framework because what they're concerned about is that raw materials that are, in, uh, uh, that are in, coming out of Indonesia are contaminated with salmonella, with uh, E. coli, 
and with heavy metals. And they wanted to know what, what our recommendation would be, and we're working with them to develop a set of standards. But they told me that just uh, in the last month that they had a two-ton shipment of kratom that they had identified that was contaminated with E. coli. Now, E. coli yeah. will kill people. Yeah, and definitely. they said, so they stopped it, and they told this vendor that they could not enter that uh, two tons of kratom material. What they fear happened is that that vendor said, okay, we're going to withdraw, destroy it. What should have happened? There, there either should have been a cleaning process that eliminated the E. coli, which is expensive and difficult, or they had to destroy it. They, they didn't do that. So what they, the FDA person, at the FDA Indonesia person told me, mm -hmm. they think they just broke it up into smaller shipments and they started sending it directly to consumers in the United States. If, if a Kratom product contaminated with E. coli kills you know, one or more people, we can argue all day long and we say, well, okay, you know, that, was, that was a rogue person out there. That's not gonna save us. So we need to be responsible parties to this regulatory system. And for those people that want to criticize the AK because we're out there saying that you have to follow the rules, that you have to invest in the equipment that's necessary to be a, a valid business in, this, in the United States for any food product, then so what? They, they need to go. And I have no sympathy for it. That's as strong as I can say. So what, what's, uh, what is the answer with uh, Indonesian distributors um, sending out clean products? Is that making sure that they have their own AKA over there and that they're testing everything before it's shipped to the U S and then the U S vendor is testing it when they get it. Absolutely. And by the way, they've made great progress in Indonesia. When I was there the first time, two years ago, I sat and watched them as they harvested uh, the Kratom leaves. They washed it in dirty river water that was polluted. They laid them out on, on uh, unsanitized uh, on the ground on un unsanitized tarps. They let it sit there for, I'm told, several days while I was standing there. Ch chickens were running across it. I thought at the time, well, that would be a potential source of salmonella, which it is. But they also said that when they're on the ground like that and unsanitized tarps, and they don't clean them between the drying uh, areas, that they, the leaves that they're drying, that, uh, that there's a small lizard that, it, that infects that area, very small, tiny ones. That's where the salmonella comes from and potentially E. coli. Uh, they've made dramatic improvements over that. Now they're building sheds where they have uh, shelves that are off the ground, screened in to stop any, any animals from getting in with roofs, and they're drying it that way. Substantial improvements. The uh, vulnerability of the grinding machines. They were using, they would shred the leaves and then put them in a grinder to make them into a powder, and they were World War II era coffee grinding machines that were not food grade stainless steel machines, and so the contamination for heavy metals was likely coming from that kind of process. And then of course, the sanitation of, the, uh, of both the workers' uh, hands that were, they were actually handling the material and the bags that were used for packing it were highly suspect. They've made light years changing, uh, changes over there that have been very positive. And in fact, when I spoke to the FDA guy yesterday, they were talking about how they are now actively testing Kratom raw materials coming to their ports to see whether or not there's contamination. They've seen a dramatic reduction in the, because of better handling procedures in the amount of suspect cases of contaminated Kratom products. The Indonesian government wants to clean this up. And the biggest impediment to doing it so that it's really good is the import alert that the FDA has placed on Kratom. Because right now, the government can't do what they would like to do, which is to require that prior to export, every vendor go through a centralized processing point where they could test for and assure that every ounce of Kratom shipped out of Indonesia was contaminant free. They can't do that now because as soon as that sort of facility is developed, then the FDA would go in and shut it down under the import alert. So in a perverse way- Because it was way, a food, right? Right. In a perverse it's way, ridiculous. the FDA has created the problem and created a more unsafe environment. Now, the good news is that we're able, because of the improvements there where things have gotten better, we also are testing now here in the United States at the point of entry. So before a responsible Kratom vendor, not the guy that's not willing to invest in testing or the equipment to process their finished product, those people should go. I'll say that over and over again. Those are the people yelling about us being narcs. Those are the people yelling at us being you know, off our lane because we've become a law enforcement agency for the federal government. That's nonsense. Uh, they are rogues in this system. So uh, for those people that are invested in testing, they test their product. They don't want 
the, the, the responsible Kratom industry in America does not want to sell a contaminated product because it will ruin the marketplace. This is the very same challenge that the generic drug industry faced when they first were created after the passage of the Hatch-Waxman Act in 1984. The generic drug industry up to that point were a group of fierce entrepreneurs that had been making uh, generic drugs in their bathtubs. And that had to change, right? And it did change. But they recognized the biggest threat to the generic drug industry growing to a legitimate industry was itself. And that's what we're facing today. The greatest threat to the creative industry are those vendors who refuse to comply with basic standards that if the FDA were doing their job would already have in place and they would have to comply with. They want to fly under the radar. They want to say, oh, I'm a libertarian. I don't believe in any regulation. And I want to be able to be this free American spirit, waving the American flag, singing God bless America and selling contaminated products. That's nonsense. They need to stop and we need to help clean it up. Yeah, I think everybody wants clean, clean products. So, you know, we can... So everybody can continue to get Kratom, all the people that need it and all the people that haven't tried it, um, that, that they could benefit from it. Now, you mentioned food a few times and looking at the KCPA, both the state and, state and federal one denote it as a food. Is there a difference between food and supplement? So this goes to the, the issue of intended use. Uh, and, and I'm talking about commercial speech here. So if you were to take the Kratom product itself, the raw material, it is classified properly as a food. It's not a drug, it's a food. It, 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 foods can have uh, uh, components that have uh, alkaloids like Kratom does. I mean, coffee has alkaloids, so it, coffee's a food. So it's not the fact that there are alkaloids that are potentially beneficial to a person's health and well-being. It's, it's proper classification as not being a drug. And so therefore it is a food. It can become, in its intended use, a dietary supplement if the, the, uh, the company that's producing the finished product chooses to formulate it that way, and if they seek and get, get the, uh, the marketing authorization from the FDA by filing a new dietary ingredient, that's required because the FDA has refused to recognize a legitimate application for Kratom to be viewed as an old dietary ingredient, meaning that it was in commerce prior to October 15th of 1994 when the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act was passed. They refuse to accept that valid evidence because what they're now saying is, and this is unique to Kratom uh, for the most part, that Kratom has to show that there was a sales slip that was attendant to a sale of a Kratom product by a retail vendor. Now, everybody knows that prior to 1994, unless you're in the very big retail outlets, you know, superstores, there was not yet a penetration of computer generated sales receipts or records. And so they're, what they're talking about were these, these uh, ethnic deli delis that were selling Kratom for years, for decades before 1994. They never kept any records. Now, they, we've had affidavits from the people that ran those stores, and they say, yeah, we sold this all the time. We imported it. We sold it. It was no big deal. The FDA refuses to recognize that, even though they have done so for other uh, substances. So there's our problem that we're, that we're dealing with uh, with respect to the uh, – uh, the, the AKA, I'm sorry, with Kratom, and, and just the way that these folks are, are dealing with it inappropriately uh, from, the, uh, from the FDA standpoint. So again, another battle we just have to continue to fight. Thanks for that, because I, I was looking at it, like I said, I, I, I found food uh, a few times. Now, what surprised me was that it's, it's basically um, Procedure for a Kratom processor to register and pay annual fee, registration fee to the state as provided for food establishments. Now, there, there's not in neither KCPA, there, there's no mention of GMP, our good manufacturing practices. So uh, we're, we're actually going to have a call here in, in about 20 minutes with, the, with a group of people to evaluate our new model for the state KCPA. And that's going to look at how we improve it. What we want to do is require that vendors offer a self-certification of meeting compliance with GMP standards with the uh, quality of their products and the, the safety of the products. And rather than having a, uh, a regulatory intensive process for which uh, there is a cost incurred by taxpayers that cannot be offset by a registration fee. So we're going to look at a little different model to make it more a requirement by the vendor to certify compliance. And then if they violate that based on a complaint, that there would then be state action. So 
uh, part of this is going to go into that whole process. But you, it, the whole idea of the KCPA is that you have properly manufactured products using GMP standards and that you don't adulterate it or contaminate it with a deliberate attempt to either synthesize the alkaloids or to add other ingredients that are dangerous to, to consumers. So what I've heard is some, um, I guess a counter to this is, you know, there's, there's local tea shops that sell tea, they import it from China and they, they sell it, they make cups of tea for their customers there. And then they also ship online too. Now that's a local tea shop that's definitely not GMP but they are certified by the state or city where, where they're operating Board of Health, Department of Health. Yeah, that you're absolutely right. The local jurisdictions will obviously play into this. And what they will be concerned about is whether the raw material is safe that they're using to brew the tea. And then is the raw material that is then classified as a finished product, which is then sold to customers uh, in, in a finished product form, whether that's compliant. So at some level, there's going to be some regulations that have to be adhered to in order to assure that you don't have a contaminated product. With a organic leafy product, there is always going to be a risk for salmonella contamination, for example. We're seeing that right now uh, where the FDA is, is going after the onions, right? And it's pretty big. It's in 43 states. They got a ton of people that have been hospitalized with it. You haven't heard the FDA say we should ban onions, right? You haven't heard that at all. So, no. so but they'll say for kratom, same conditions, they'll say we have to ban kratom. So that's the problem. The, the, until it gets to the level, the, the, the product, in this case kratom, gets to the level for the FDA to classify it as an unapproved drug, which the FDA has done for kratom, that's what triggers the problem we're having. And the narrative and the disinformation campaign that they're widely distributing across the country to all these regulatory agencies. And that's the battleground that we're fighting on. The, when, when, I, when I said that we were, when I put it out online that we were going to have another interview and I asked for questions, I actually got a few that were, and I told them it was from Import Alert 5414 and Import Alert 5415 um, about clear labeling. You know, they, they thought this truth in labeling was going to mean that, okay, now we'll be able to have use instructions, you know, how much people are supposed to take, proper warnings. And it, it was always my explanation that it's because of those import alerts that Kratom vendors, they can get in trouble if they put the proper warnings on their proper use instructions for, for food or a dietary ingredient. So it is, um, if you just want to address that about clear, concise labeling. Yeah, and, and that they're, they're right. Except now with the states acting in between and saying, if you want to sell Kratom in our state, you have to label it this way, that gets in between that import alert because the import alert is supposed to be, the statutory authorization for it was to allow for the identification of a specific vendor in a foreign country that was shipping into the United States, a specific product, and then it allowed for that vendor to clean up their product and get off the import alert. No such provision exists for the Kratom world. So what the states are doing, and it, we think it's, it's part of our, our uh, program to get the states to authorize it, the, the Utah Department of Agriculture has just issued their rule that allows for the proper labeling of a Kratom product. And that, I think, gets in between the FDA being able to say, oh, well, you, you're now selling a product that is labeled for human consumption. It is obvious that when we sell a Kratom product that it's for human consumption. And this idea that we have to dodge around it has got to be over. And I think the state, in the same way that medical marijuana, which is a federally scheduled substance, which is banned at a federal level, is not allowed to be sold, same for CBD. Uh, it, was, it was Commissioner Hahn that said before the uh, state agriculture commissioners at their meeting in DC in February, it would be a fool's errand for the FDA to try to regulate the sale of CBD products. People are buying it. It's a part of, the, of commerce today that there's so many people buying it. We can't get in the way of that. We should regulate it appropriately and inform consumers. That's what the state KCPA does. And that's what the federal KCPA will require the FDA to get into regulations to allow for it to be appropriately regulated free from the current restrictions that are there. Yeah, that's good. Cause a lot of people, you know, they, they want to um, recommend it to a friend or something. And then someone looks at it they're like, I don't even know what to do with this. And it's very hard for the elderly too, you know, to get like someone like my mom or dad to try to, try to take it, you know, that they're, especially they look up the FDA stuff. So some good labeling right, would, right. would mean a lot. So I know you got to go soon. I got a couple more. Now you, you said, Basically, the FDA doesn't have the, um, 
the the resources to try to go after every single creative vendor and you said ultimately that this you guys if a vendor if you guys get a report and they don't cooperate they don't want to take it down or change their wording that basically won't mean too much to the fda now do you know fear- the fda the fda if they identify this is the one thing they're doing that's great if they identify a company that's making an impermissible health claim they will import they'll send them a warning letter enforce they'll make them withdraw from the marketplace they should so do you think that and this will get into my next question about basically the Indonesian distributors, because a lot of them make health claims. A lot of them are not testing. Um, do you think this is going to hurt the industry? Like, cause we see it all over the news that, you know, the FDA caught this person making health claims or, or the Sal Manila and it gets to these huge stories. So do you think feeding the FDA uh, these, these cases of people not labeling properly or making health claims will ultimately hurt the Kratom community? So, so the answer to that, and that's a great question, and it's the pivotal question. If we are actively out reporting them, they'll go away because no one wants to get that warning letter and the enforcement action from the Department of Justice about them selling an improperly labeled product. We need to clean up the industry, and that will ultimately be the protection. A little pain up front, but it will ultimately protect our industry, and those people that are marketing, any of them, whether from Indonesia directly or here in the United States, if they're making impermissible health claims, let's clean this up because ultimately we want a safe marketplace. And right now, if, if, if someone is selling a Kratom product that makes an impermissible health claim or it has an adulterant in it that justifies their claim for their therapeutic claim, we want that cleaned up. We want to protect the marketplace for raw, pure, safe Kratom products for consumers. So that, that goes perfect into, into my next thing is uh, with the KSPA, you're saying raw, uh, kratom products what does that mean for extracts that are on the market because those are basically concentrated they're they're not going to be at that two percent below that two percent threshold of mitrogene that, that you uh that's in the kcpa so what does that mean for all of the extracts that are on the market so so nature got it right on the allocation in the kratom plant between the overall alkaloid composition of mitrogenine at 66 percent relatively and and at seven hydroxymetrogenine at two percent or under that's a great balance. And all we require of the extracts to remain legal is to maintain the same proportion as they, as they concentrate it. They keep the same proportional levels of metrogeny and 7 hydroxymetrogenine so they aren't producing an unsafe product. That's all we're doing. We have no problem with, with extracts. I know that some people try to, to inject that into the debate. We, we don't ban extracts. We don't have a problem with extracts if they're properly formulated, maintaining that same nature's balance between the alkaloid content of their products. That's good, yeah, that will put uh, a lot of people at, at rest. And the, the last one is about the Indonesian sellers. Basically what my understanding is the KCPA passes, uh, the federal KCPA passes, now no Indonesian seller will legally be able to sell directly to US consumer. Is that no, correct? It, you know, this, it's an unfortunate part of a free market system they can continue to sell directly. They have to make sure that it's safe. They have to test it. They can't be selling an unsafe product. They can't be making uh, illegal therapeutic claims. There are many Indonesian vendors who are selling directly to American consumers and American consumers who buy it because it's cheaper uh, and they're making all these claims, right? Or they're selling poorly tested or not tested at all products. We wanna clean that up, but there'll still be a marketplace for uh, a Indonesian farmer. And without the import alert, then the Indonesian government will step in and say, you're not sending Kratom out of this country without it being tested and being safe before you send it. So that'll be a great outcome of the federal KCPA. That will be great, because that was a big concern about the Indonesian sellers not being able to sell. I mean, I want to see them basically testing at an ISO accredited lab, and then then they can feel free to, to sell their stuff on the, on the American market. Agreed, agreed. So Mac, anything else before we go? No, thank you for this opportunity. I know that we we work hard. Uh, and, and by the way, I respect anyone that has a disagreement and a grievance with the AK. This is a free country and you can criticize us, but it ought to be based on facts. And and I know that there, uh, there are some who have been very loud in this space who have claimed that we're guilty of all sorts of terrible criminal acts, RICO and whatever. And that is silliness. Uh, and it's not grounded in any reality. We are committed to one thing, and that is a, a safe Kratom consumer marketplace. And we want to encourage open competition and pricing that benefits consumers. That's our game. 
And these people that want to just cry about what, you know, their, their own business model, which is defective and has nothing to do with Kratom. Any business model that relies upon, you know, going around existing regulations that would allow for the production of a safe product because it's cheaper for them, then they're, they're out of bounds. And frankly, I don't care what industry you're in, if you're putting consumers at risk because of your own selfish economic motive, you need the consequence. And that's our bottom line. We want safe products that benefit the consuming is protected one way. That's great. All right, Mac. Thanks so much. Hey, appreciate it very much. Look forward to seeing this when you get it edited. Yeah, probably that a week. Okay, good.